Good evening. My name is Eva Fierst. I'm the education curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art here at UMass. I want to thank Mass Humanities and the Five College Lecture Fund for making this series possible. Today's talk is a concluding event of the boys in our time. It will provide historic context to the work and life of William E. B. Du Bois and will illuminate the social and historical climate of his time. While Du Bois is the giant on whose shoulders we all stand, there are others who worked and lived to further the cause of social justice and equality. Let me introduce the participants. Professor Barbara Krauthammer teaches history here at UMass. Her fields of interest are the antebellum period, slavery and emancipation, and African American history. She has published numerous articles and book chapters. Her most recent book, which is not her most recent, more in, in, uh, in, in today's events, her second to most recent book, uh, she wrote together with Deborah Willis of the New York uh, University, Envisioning Emancipation, Black Americans and the End of Slavery. It features 150 historical photographs of enslaved and free African Americans from the 1850s to the 1930s and includes four essays that discuss the photographic representation of slavery, emancipation, and freedom. Her most recent book just arrived in the mail this morning, mm -hmm. according to Ned, and it is called Black Slaves, Indian Masters, Slavery, Emancipation, and Citizenship in the Native American South. So it is completely exciting to hear the title already. I can't wait to open the book. Next is Professor Nick Brommel, Department of English. He was the founder and editor of the Boston Review and has been president of the New England American Studies Association. He is the principal convener of Democratic Vistas, an interdisciplinary seminar in political theory and cultural studies. Nick Prommel seeks to demonstrate that works of literature and popular culture can be expressions of philosophy and political theory. His publications reflect this particular interest. He is the author of By the Sweat of the Brow, Literature and Labor in Antebellum America, and Tomorrow Never Knows, Rock and Psychedelics in the, psychedelics in the 1960s. But his most recent book, I think it's the recent book, Black and More Than Black, African American Imaginings of US Democracy is also devel available tonight at this table. And it just came out last month. Right? Right. Preston Smith is professor of politics and chair of the Africana Studies Department at Mount Holyoke College. He teaches American politics, black urban reform, racial stratification and urban political economy, and black and Latino politics. He is the director of community-based learning program at the Weisman Center for Leadership and the Liberal Arts, where students interact with local communities through community-based research and service. Professor Smith's fields of interest are post-war black politics, inner city neighborhood revitalization, including economic development, affordable housing, quality public education, and equal and adequate delivery of municipal services. He has lectured and published widely. His most recent book, Racial Democracy and the Black Metropolis, Housing Policy in Post-War Chicago examines housing debates in Chicago that go beyond black and white politics. Please help me welcome the three speakers. Thank you very much, Eva, and thanks also to Loretta Yarlow and their staffs and uh, all people involved for organizing and hosting this great series of panels and talks and exhibits. And uh, I think we're all three honored to be kind of closing the show down here with uh, the last panel. Um, what I'm going to try to do is uh, 
imaginatively reconstruct what Du Bois would tell us about building a social movement today. And the four key words that I'll be focusing on are incompleteness, criticism, infinity or infinitude, and imagination. These are not words that one immediately associates with Du Bois. And the, uh, the picture of Du Bois I'm limbing here may be a bit unfamiliar to you, but I assure you he did exist, he does exist. Um, um, but first I want to look very briefly, um, really for the benefits of all of us here, um, at the, some of the social movements Du Bois was aware of and engaged with during his lifetime. One was the women's suffrage movement. Du Bois was very aware of the political power of black women's clubs, and he supported women's suffrage frequently in editorials in the crisis. And I think Barbara will be speaking more about that particular movement. Another social movement uh, swirling around Du Bois in his lifetime was the labor movement, about which Du Bois had very mixed feelings. He was very critical of the racism of the white working class, Nonetheless, by the middle of the 1930s, he was a strong advocate of what he called industrial democracy, by which he meant a significant degree of worker and popular control of industry, or what we would now call corporations, perhaps. Yet another movement that he was involved with very intimately and importantly, I think, was the worldwide anti-colonial movement, of which really he was one of the founders. He helped organize the Pan-African Conference of 1919 and was involved in subsequent Pan-African Conferences in 1921, 1923, and 1927. And all of these were significant precursors of the Bandung Conference of 1955. Of course, most famously and obviously, he was a founder of the Niagara Movement in 1906 and then of the NAACP a movement that, as I'm sure most of you know, rejected Booker T. Washington's conciliatory approach to white racism. Yet we should note also that Du Bois rejected and opposed the most significant black social movement of his time, Garveyism. And eventually, in the mid-1930s, he became disenchanted by the seemingly or really slow progress made by the NAACP and argued that the cause of black justice of justice for black Americans could be advanced more quickly if African Americans formed their own independent economic base. And he left the NAACP in 1934. Du Bois thus had a complex and at times inconsistent relation to the specific social movements of his time. The one safe generalization I think we can make with respect to all of them is that Du Bois was principally an intellectual and a writer. He was an effective public speaker, to be sure, but he was a brilliant writer. His chosen medium was print, not the speaker's platform. So I'm going to approach Du Bois in these terms, focusing on his intellectual analysis of democracy and social movements, rather than on his activism or participation in them. The key terms, again, uh, around which I'm organizing uh, my remarks are incompleteness, criticism, infinitude, and imagination incompleteness. To know one type of mind is it given to discern the totality of truth. In 1890, when Du Bois was a very young man, just 22 years old, he delivered a commencement address at Harvard. You can imagine how surprised his almost entirely white audience would have been by his choice of topic. Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, even more surprising was the praise that he seemed to bestow on Davis at the beginning of his remarks. He begins by acknowledging Davis as a, quote, typical Teutonic hero. This was at a time, by the way, when Teutonic had a different kind of resonance than it does today. And applauding, quote, the history of civilization during the last millennium, a history which has been, quote, the development of the idea of the strong man, of which he, Davis, was the embodiment. Davis was a soldier and a lover, Du Bois declares, a statesman and a ruler, passionate, ambitious, and indomitable, bold, reckless guardian of the peoples. All judged by the whole standard of Teutonic civilizations, there is something noble in the figure of Jefferson Davis, Du Bois declared. But just at this moment, Du Bois's argument took a turn. He recoils from Davis by rhetorically constructing himself as a dispassionate observer 
wholly removed from the subject he is discussing. And from that vantage point, he exposes the limitedness or the partiality of the Teutonic standard of uh, civilization, and then he unfolds it in a larger and more complete whole. Judged by every canon of human justice, he begins, there is something fundamentally incomplete about that standard. Here's where the word incomplete comes in. Considered as a type, David is, is not so much wrong as partial, and so is the type of civilization which his life represented. Such a civilization, says Du Bois, is based on individualism coupled with the rule of might. Its ideals are power and conquest. Under whatever guise a Jefferson Davis may appear, as man, as race, or as nation, his life can only logically mean this, the advance of a part at the expense of a whole. Du Bois then criticizes, with what I think must surely have been a sidelong glance at his mainly white audience, people who become convinced that the object of the world is not civilization, but Teutonic civilization. The world has needed and will need its Jefferson Davis, as he acknowledges, but such a type is incomplete and never can serve its best purposes until checked by complementary ideas. And that word checked, as you'll see, is important too. There's an implication of conflict and criticism there. From whence shall these complementary ideas come? They shall come, he suggests, from the South, and in particular from the Negro, who can offer the world a different ideal the change made in the conception of civilization by the sensibility and the orientation of the African American is profound. And Du Bois describes it as the submission of the strength of the strong to the advance of all, not in mere aimless sacrifice, but recognizing the fact that to no one type of mind is it given to discern the totality of truth. Thus, civilization cannot afford to lose the contribution of the very least of nations for its full development. It is not only the assertion of the I, but also the submission to the thou that is the highest individualism." Unquote. These are all from his book, Dark, no, the, this is all from that uh, uh, 1922 commencement address. Here he arrives at the core of his argument, indeed of his political philosophy. To no one type of mind is it given to discern the totality of the truth. His speech is not just about the virtues of Jefferson Davis or about his incompleteness or about how incompleteness can be remedied in a larger whole that concludes the African American's complementary ideas. Most deeply, Du Bois warns his audience and us to beware when any one group, class, race, truth, or perspective claims to be or to know the all of it or to represent the all of it. Instead, he suggests we must always seek for the but also that supplements and complements a partial representation and an incomplete understanding. These points are central to his political philosophy and his, to his, rela in his relation to social movements. The key for Du Bois always is to seek a broadening, widening, and enlarging of horizons, a widening of what counts as the truth, a widening of what counts as the people, and crucially, this broadening leads to a transformation a nation that includes and embraces the sensibility of the African American, he says, is transformed by it. Inclusion, then, in his terms, is not accommodation or integration, but transformation. So now I want to kind of elaborate on uh, that overview, really, by looking at criticism and infinitude and imagination. Honest and earnest criticism, says Du Bois, from those whose interests are most nearly touched criticism by, of writers by readers, of government by those governed, of leaders by those led. This is the soul of democracy and the safeguard of modern democracy. To understand fully what Du Bois takes such criticism to be, we need to notice how much is packed into his phrase, nearly touched, those whose interests are most nearly touched. And to do that, we have to take a kind of tour through a lot of his writing because touch is a key word in his political vocabulary. He writes, for example, that, quote, politics have not touched the matters of daily life which are nearest the interests of the people, unquote. Or that, quote, when voting touches the vital everyday interests of all, nominations and elections will call for more intelligent activity. In his autobiography, Du Bois writes that teaching summer school in Tennessee, <clears throat> 
was an invaluable experience because, quote, I touched the very shadow of slavery. I lived and taught in log cabins built before the Civil War. I touched intimately the lives of the commonest of mankind. And in another passage of his autobiography, Du Bois writes, this my training touched but obliquely, and I could bring criticism from what I knew and saw touching the Negro. Thus, criticism is honest and earnest when it touches and is touched by something, when it engages with something rather than simply distancing itself in order to gain a critical perspective on it. Du Bois's theory of democracy and of social movements, I would say, it conceives of these as an endless process of such criticism in which the multiple and different perspectives of those whose interests are touched become aggregated or pooled in what Anna Julia Cooper would have called a stable equilibrium of opposition. Democracy alone, he writes, is the method of showing the whole experience of the race for the benefit of the future, unquote. Democracy rests finally on recognition of, quote, the worth of a person's feeling and experiences to all, unquote. Quote, to disenfranchise any group is to deliberately turn from knowledge and grope in ignorance, unquote. And, quote, no state can be strong which excludes from its expressed wisdom the knowledge possessed by mothers, wives, daughters, and by other excluded groups, unquote. The aim of politics and social movements, then, is to criticize those who claim to be the all, to respect the perspective and the knowledge of those excluded groups who have been kept out of the whole, and then to fight through criticism to enlarge the whole and include them thereby transforming the whole. Suffering as knowing. As we've seen, inclusion does not mean integration. It means transformation. And for Du Bois, this is one of the most interesting things about his work for me. Um, it means transformation because the knowledge that excluded bring, people bring in is the knowledge that they have gained and earned through suffering injustice. And the knowledge gained by suffering injustice comes from an experience that Du Bois thinks is utterly private and unshareable by others. He has this kind of radical epistemology, thinks you cannot know my suffering, nobody can. I cannot know the suffering of anybody in this room. Therefore, for us to communicate, we have to be able to respect the radical difference that each person brings to the table as we talk and deliberate democratically or build social movements. So he writes, in the last analysis, only the man himself, however humble, knows his own condition. That is, in the last analysis, these are all his words, only the sufferer knows his own suffering. And, quote, all this goes to prove that human beings are and must be woefully ignorant of each other. But from this kind of, you might think, pessimistic view of human communication, he draws the conclusion that a democracy and a social movement can transform this private pain into a political good when the pain is understood to be each individual's distinctive knowledge of what he or she can contribute to the whole. Imagination and infinitude. Following this trail of Du Bois's key words, criticism, whole, touch, difference, suffering, we shouldn't be surprised to, coming, to find ourselves coming to the word infinity imagination and dream. For if the democratic whole should always be seen as open to further revision and wider inclusion, it is by definition infinite. And the infinite cannot be grasped by reason, only by the imagination. Hence Du Bois's unyielding commitment throughout his life to the belief that the imagination plays an indispensable role in the creation of a democratic political culture or of social movements. Indeed, even as Du Bois' commitment and interest in Marxist uh, dialectical materialism deepened in the 1930s, he continued to celebrate and affirm the politically transformative powers of the imagination. For example, in his 1941 essay on Phyllis Wheatley, he presents her as a visionary whose prophetic dreams were later realized in the work of later African-American writers. Quote, it is these imagined visions of Phyllis that made her Phyllis the blessed almost certainly apply, implying a reference to himself in particular, Du Bois writes, always a certain sense of mystery lurked in the furthest reaches of Phyllis's consciousness. The miracle of her sudden transport to this far land, 
the hoarse, hoarse voice of the visions, the deep dire visions thus floated and drifted, loomed and died in her thoughts and dreams. In the only home she knew and the only friends she had, she was always partly a stranger. Only her fantasy was real, only her dreams were true. Du Bois himself was and remained an imaginative writer throughout his life, writing poems, novels, plays. A secularist to the core and a rationalist master of empirical argument and icy logic, he nonetheless crowded his over with the specters of the unknown and the unknowable. Du Bois's poems, novels, and books of creative essays demand that we as readers continually lift our eyes from the here and now and, and the factual to contemplate a world that can be approached only by way of the imagination. In a 1933 editorial in The Crisis, we see Du Bois criticizing any group that, that lays claim to know the infinite, but at the same time he's affirming the importance of the infinite. And here's what he writes, he, the young African American, should see in the church an expression of the desire for full and ultimate truth. That desire for goodness and beauty which is ingrained in every human being. And on the other hand, and just as clearly, he should frankly denounce all attempts on the part of any organized body of human beings when they declare that they know it all and that God has personally told them about it. That is a plain lie and they know it and everybody else ought to know it. We must have religion in the sense of striving for the infinite, the ultimate, and the best. But just as truly we must straightly curb the effort of any exclusive guild to be the single and final arbiter of individual interpretation of desired and desirable truth. And in Color and Democracy, one of his last books written at the end of the Second World War in a desperate effort to influence the behavior of the great powers toward the former colonies, he makes the same set of moves we saw in his commencement address and makes the same um, kind of claims on behalf of the imagination. He begins by saying um, reason in the 20th century and in the 20th century, 21st probably, is going to be the lingua franca. You know, people from all around the world are going to have to meet and communicate through the language of reason. And this is why religious language cannot be allowed to trumpet. He says, my attitude toward organized religion is distinctly critical. He explicitly rejects the possibility, quote, that any chosen body of people or a special organization of mankind has received a direct revelation of ultimate truth. But then he goes on to say, hmm, we scientists and secular social scientists engaged in progressive causes actually would be really dumb to turn our back on uh, the, quote, the majority of the best and earnest people of the world who are organized in religious groups. And he says that without the cooperation of the richness of their emotional experience and the unselfishness of their aims, science stands helpless before crude fact. So he looks for what he calls common ground between these two communities, secular and sacred, you might say. And he says, well, on the one hand, religion is going to have to surrender its dogma to the extent of being willing to work for human salvation on this side of eternity. But likewise, the scientific community, including political secularists like himself, will have to admit, quote, that what we know is vastly exceeded by what we do not know. And there may be realms in time and space of infinitely more importance than the problems of this small world. In sum, Du Bois believed that imagination or spirituality, when understood as respect for the infinite and the unknowable, are as essential as reason to political movements and social movements in particular. And I think this is one reason why Amiri Baraka's words about souls of black folk are true also of Du Bois' work as a whole. Quote, it is not only a great work of science of US and Afro-American history, but it is written as few such works ever could be, for it is the soul of a poet that speaks to us. Conclusion. Okay, what does this tell us about building social movements? Well, there's a field out there called social movement theory, and that's concerned with nothing but how social movements have been built, why they come, how they come into being, how they flourish, and why they pass away. And I can't possibly summarize that, not, not because of time constraints, 
because I don't know enough. I hardly know anything about it. But I do know about this one book by a guy named Douglas McAdams who wrote a groundbreaking uh, work on black insurgency between 1935 and 65 in a book called Political Process and the Development of Black Insurgency, 1982. It's pretty dated now. But I think his points here serve as an interesting foil to Du Bois. McAdams writes that first, for a social movement to come into being, change has to seem to be possible. When people believe that change is impossible. Social movement can't come into being. And he says the change becomes possible when the structure of political opportunities improves. So he's really looking at the early New Deal features in the consolidated political establishment of that time that opened up new political opportunities for African Americans. Two, the second thing that's required, for, says McAdams, is a growing sense of political efficacy. That is, once people imagine that change is possible because structures of political opportunity have changed, they then start acting, and if they see that their acting has results, if it's effective, then the movement builds. And the third thing that McAdams says the history of black insurgency in these decades indicates about social movements is that um, you need institutions to sustain them. You need institutions to give them material resources, mimeograph machines, cash, website building, whatever it might be. But I think Du Bois would come in and add a couple of things to these, this list of three ingredients to a social movement that McAdams puts out there. Um, the first, all of these you might say are um, conditions, intellectual conditions or conditions of understanding, what, what we who might want to build social movements have to understand in order to do it. First is that we have to understand that democracy is always incomplete and that it's in the nature of democracy that a part will gain power and claim to be the whole, okay? And then it's the job for the rest to contest that and to reveal, to expose that this group that's claiming to be the whole, whether it be racial, white, economic, the 1%, is really only a part. The second thing I think he would emphasize is the importance of criticism and conflict. This enlarging of the whole, this displacement of one representation of the whole by a broader one, does not happen except through criticism and conflict. Um, note to Obama, celebrations and hope and calls for unity are not enough. And finally, Du Bois would urge us to understand that we are all finite human beings who do not know and cannot claim to know it all. On an interpersonal level, this means understanding that only the sufferer knows his suffering. Therefore, the wisdom of each sufferer must be respected and brought into the whole as something distinct and ultimately unknowable by others. On a philosophical level, it means accepting that what we know will always be exceeded by what we do not know. And therefore, any theory of politics, any program of democracy must be unclosed, must be open, open-ended, because we can't know it all. And on a political level, it means respecting the imagination. The imagination is what enables us to break through our sense that change is not possible. We cannot always wait until the structure of political opportunity improves. People can change only when they can imagine change. So a sense of the incompleteness of democracy or of any system or claim to be the truth, a willingness to criticize it, and an awareness of our own incompleteness and finitude that brings about a deep respect for the imagination. I think these would be th ingredients that Du Bois would urge us to include in our building of social movements. Now, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for the invitation to participate. This is really lovely. And it's nice to see some colleagues and friends and students in the audience. Um, so I have prepared a different set of remarks on a decidedly different topic that I hope in the end all three um, of our presentations will come together and allow you to ask some questions and offer some thoughts about the broad topic of social movements um, and social movements in the era of Du Bois and today perhaps. Um, 
My, my work, my research and my writing focuses on enslaved women mainly and then emancipated women, and women who went from slavery to freedom. Um, more recently, I've been concentrating my efforts on black women's attempts to liberate themselves from slavery, mainly through escape, but also sometimes through lawsuits. Um, and then I've been examining the ways in which they articulated and expressed and embodied the inherently political meanings of freedom and self-liberation. That is what it meant to take possession of one's body, one's sexuality, one's life, and indeed one's family and one's community. And so to this end and to connect to today, I've spent a great deal of time lately thinking about black women's history as a field of study, about black women as historical subjects, and specifically looking at the lives and works of black women writers, black women intellectuals, and black women activists. And at the same time that I've been doing this research about black women um, as historical subjects, I've also spent a fair amount of time reflecting on the place that black women as intellectuals figures in our scholarship, figures in our teaching, and really figures in the very frameworks and paradigms that we as scholars and teachers use to examine and to understand the history of black political and intellectual engagement writ large in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and so what I would like to do today is offer a little bit of an overview of black women's intellectual activism, what I would argue is really sort of social activism rooted in a deeply intellectual tradition and moment in the late 19th century, and to really suggest um, that we think about some of these women from the late 19th century really as the people who opened avenues of thought for Du Bois. Um, indeed, in many instances, their writing, their organization, their intellectual work and activism um, emerges sometimes before that of Du Bois and sometimes um, at the same time. And I think that there was much more of a conversation happening at the level of intellect, at the level of writing and producing knowledge and producing ideas um, that maybe we fully accounted for. And that there's really, I think, much more room to think about the roles of black women intellectuals in influencing Du Bois's thought and his own ideas about racism and about justice. Um, so I thought I would begin in 1896 when a fairly sizable contingent of black women representing different local reform organizations, reform clubs, organized what became known as the National Association of Colored Women. Um, and the organization emerged out of a convention that many club women activists organized specifically to protest an 1895 letter written by a man named James Jacks. And maybe this is familiar to some of you. Jax was the president of the Missouri Press Association and achieved notoriety in this moment um, for his deliberate efforts to silence the anti-lynching campaign of Ida B. Wells. And Wells had gone on a tour in England, a lecture tour. She had lectured against lynching, um, specifically with the intention, right, of exposing the extent to which um, the image of a black man as a rapist of white women was rooted in fallacy and lies rather than truth. And so Wells compiled um, a spectacular array of statistics to really disprove this myth. At the same time, Wells also devoted herself to calling attention to the sexual abuse that black women had historically endured um, in slavery and then after emancipation. Um, the sexual abuse at the hands of white men, their owners, and then subsequently their employers and other men in their communities. So Wells had gone on this lecturing tour in England in 1895, and uh, Jack's strategy to discredit Wells was to publicly degrade all black women, 
specifically Wells, um, but all women in general. And he did so by writing to the British woman who was the secretary of the London Anti-Lynching Committee. And in his public letter, right, it was a publicly printed letter, Jax declared that black women were, quote, prostitutes by nature, he implied, right, and, quote, natural liars and thieves. He explained or asserted that out of 200 in this vicinity, meaning 200 black women, it is doubtful if there are a dozen virtuous women of that number who are not daily thieving from white people. And so in the wake of Jax's letter, right, and this public assertion that black women, especially those who had moved into the roles of public activists, right, into, um, onto the public stage, challenging racism and specifically the intersection of racism and, sex, um, racism and sexism um, and denouncing them as lacking virtue and as inherently prostitutes by which he did not have a modern sense of sex workers, but meant, of course, that black women lacked any virtue or respectability as women. Um, so a number of women, including Mary Church Terrell, Anna Julia Cooper, whom we heard described briefly earlier, um, stepped up and amplified their already existing, their current efforts um, of activism as a means of demonstrating their determination, their power, and their ability to challenge these intersectional issues of racism and sexism, as well as issues of poverty that plagued so many black women and men and communities. Um, at this time, Anna Julia Cooper noted that the time had come for women, she wrote, to, quote, help shape, mold, and direct the thought of their day. Margaret Murray Washington of the Tuskegee Women's Club, who was also Booker T. Washington's second wife, likewise explained that black women were, quote, suddenly awakened by the wholesale charges of the lack of virtue and character. Similarly, Chicago's Fanny Barrier Williams stated that this reviled letter, quote, stirred the intelligent colored women of America as nothing had ever done. Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin wrote an editorial for the club women's publication, The Woman's Era, in which she called on black women activists to, quote, read this document carefully and discriminatingly and decide if it, not, if it be not time for us to stand before the world and declare ourselves and our principles. The time is short, but everything is ripe. And remember, earnest women can do anything. So Ruffin's call for black women to organize in defense of themselves signaled the beginning of what would become known as a national black woman's movement that was dedicated to both the defense of black women but also to the advancement of black women and black people in general. The National Federation of Afro-American Women then joined with the Colored Women's League to form the National Association of Colored Women, and they elected Mary Church Terrell as its first president in 1896. The NACW's core principle was to promote racial uplift through self-help. At the same time, however, many women who were involved with the NACW boldly embraced Ida B. Wells' call that they should speak out loudly and confidently against sexual violence, right, against the sexual violence directed towards black women, in conjunction with protesting the racism endured by black men, and specifically the campaign of racist terror in the form of lynching, directed mainly, though not exclusively, at black men. And so very quickly then, the NACW emerged as black women's central vehicle for activism and for leadership. And like so many black men, women talked about themselves and the work that they were doing as, quote, race work. But they understood themselves as leaders, as intellectuals, as writers, and as activists who were engaging both the dynamics of racism and formulating strategies to combat it in ways that directly addressed the issues that were most relevant to black women. That is, they maintained that what would come to be known as the color line, 
right, when Du Bois writes that the problem of the 20th century is that of the color line, these black women of the late 19th century set the tone for very clearly understanding and articulating that the color line was always gendered and was always informed by intersectional understandings and experiences of racism and sexism. And consequently, the strategies that they devised and plans that they imagined to achieve justice were equally as gendered. That is, that they very clearly understood that justice looked different from the perspective of an African-American woman than it might from an African-American man. And that while the experience of racism was a collective one, that racism in itself was also gendered. And this was really the cause to which they dedicated themselves, and the cause to which they insisted was the cause of the race. So while they didn't necessarily articulate a specific argument and claim as black women, they maintained that racism could never be dismantled if the questions about racism and sexism were not confronted head on. Club women, of course, were never united in their views, right? They embraced and articulated a wide range of attitudes towards the best way to improve women's lives, um, a wide range of attitudes regarding the appropriate sphere for women's activism and influence, and a wide range of views about the best ways of pursuing claims of justice in the face of such violent racism. They were nonetheless united in a bedrock understanding that changing the conditions of all black people's lives necessarily entailed addressing the conditions of black women's lives, and that the two were so intertwined that they could not be distilled. Um, the 1880s and 1890s, as we know, was a period characterized by legally sanctioned and extra-legal white supremacist violence aimed at all black Americans. A variety of state laws and local customs ensured that most black people, especially in the southern states, remained indebted, coerced as laborers, or imprisoned, and often the three were intertwined. Um, laws of segregation um, ascended in the United States by the late 1880s as well, right, and sanctioned um, the use of police force to enforce segregation. And during this period, black communities and leaders, both men and women, largely turned inward, right, creating their own institutions, their own businesses. It's during this period in the late 19th century that black bankers, black merchants, black newspapers, black beauticians, undertakers, an array of entrepreneurial activities flourish in black communities. And it's during this moment as well that the NACW achieved prominence. Right. In 1896, the National Association of Club Women um, boasted the membership of about 200 clubs nationally. Um, 20 years later, by 1916, the number of affiliated associations had jumped to 1,500 clubs nationwide. By the early 20th century, the NACW very clearly articulated a set of goals and agendas and concerns that addressed black women in politics. Right, so that they moved from looking inward at local communities, thinking about kindergartens, um, women in the home, domestic training, and employment skills, to increasingly articulating the need for a platform that recognized black women as intellectual leaders, as political visionaries, and as individuals who could articulate a political agenda for the local and national community. Um, Many women, likewise, looked transnationally. That is to say, women like Anna Julia Cooper contemplated and articulated pan-Africanist thought at the same time that men like Du Bois were contemplating the nature of the African diaspora and the power of pan-Africanism. Pauline Hopkins, for instance, explored the notion of a dias diasporic bond of kinship in her writings for the Colored American Magazine, which was the most widely circulated black literary publication prior to the advent of the crisis. Anna Julia Cooper participated in the earliest major Pan-African conferences in London as early as 1900, attending the conferences with Du Bois. Right? And both Cooper and Du Bois in their writing bristle at the idea that imperialism would indeed spur so-called progress and advancement and civilization among the world's populations um, of color in Africa and Asia, for example. 
Yet interestingly, these women's voices tend to fall out of scholarly investigations of the black discourse um, and an anti-imperialist discourse. To be sure, men wrote volumes more than women did on the subject. Nonetheless, women like Cooper, Pauline Hopkins, Ida B. Wells, as well as Nanny Burroughs and Frances Harper certainly turned their attention and their pens to Western imperialist ideologies and realities. Of course, Du Bois was a great supporter of black women activists and their political <laughs> aims. Yet at the same time, his views about women's roles in leadership, the positions he took sanctioning women's leadership roles in, say, the Niagara movement, evolved and changed over time. And I think that as scholars and as teachers and as people interested in claims of justice, we would do well to think carefully about the evolution of Du Bois' thought regarding women and to really pay much closer attention to women's roles in shaping that thought. Anna Julia Cooper, for instance, um, published her, um, her book, which I often carry around with me, um, A Voice from the South, was published in 1892. And it's in A Voice from the South where Cooper very clearly articulates right, that the progress of African Americans in the United States and indeed of all people of color worldwide really rises and falls with the conditions of women's lives in these communities. A Voice from the South was published a full decade before Du Bois and Booker T. Washington entered their own debate in print about the nature of black political activism and the best way to um, combat racism. Right, so that is a full decade before that, Cooper wrote her own tome, addressing precisely the questions that these men would engage ten years later. So while we often see Du Bois positioned as the authority, we might spend some more attention given to his, to his intellectual engagement with black women writers and thinkers, as his colleagues, as his peers, and really as his teachers. Um, and we might do so to understand both their role in the movement of the early 20th century, but to also understand how they informed Du Bois's ideas about gender, about women's rights, and his own early articulations supporting black feminist thought and activism. Certainly we know a great deal about his writings on the subject of reproduction, of black family life, families and migration, and women's suffrage, but I'm less convinced that we have exhausted thinking about the ways in which his ideas are really indebted to the work of black women intellectuals. We do ourselves, our students, and indeed these great figures like Cooper and Wells and Du Bois, we do them all a disservice if we continue in our own work to relegate women to the margins of our thinking about the nature of politics, activism, and justice. So I will end there so we have some more time for discussion. I'd like to add my thanks for the invitation and thanks for you um, coming out this evening. Um, please, I apologize for this cold. Um, so it's like um, my voice and a frog um, also um, talking with you this, um, this evening. My remarks are going to be around um, two ideas that come from Du Bois, really, uh, that I think help to influence um, sort of racial ideologies of post-war social movements, civil rights and black power. Um, and that is the idea of the town of the 10th, uh, which he uh, really constructs in the late 19th century, early 20th century, um, but doesn't necessarily disengage from, uh, even as he um, joins the Communist Party and, um, and uh, becomes, uh, I think, more, it's been a socialist over time and then becomes a communist later. The second one has to do with the idea of um, the problem of the 20th century being the problem of the color line. And I think uh, one of the things we want to consider um, is not to kind of assume that the problem of the 21st century is also the color line, but to think in particular, um, uh, and what my remarks are going to be about, is the relationship between race uh, and class. Um, and um, not so much in Du Bois' thinking, but in the ways in which I think helped to shape the ideas uh, of those who were involved in civil rights and then later uh, in black power. We 
tend to think, I think now, um, maybe less so, but certainly before, that if one was in favor of racial equality, one also was in favor of class equality. That we, in a sense, almost argued uh, or assumed that if you pursued racial equality, uh, it was a proxy for class equality. And that's understandable given the fact that many, um, certainly people of color, are locked into poor and working class strata. So if you work to free them or to liberate them, you were also pursuing uh, class um, equality. But more recently, um, I think um, it's been a little more apparent that at least within um, the black community and within the black political class, um, that that is an assumption that we shouldn't necessarily make. And I have a couple examples of that. Um, one has to do uh, with um, and my work has to do with housing policy. So one has to do with the really sort of stepping back away from public housing that the black political class has done throughout the country um, and has embraced Hope 6 mixed income developments as the way in which to go. And then if you don't know about that, that's all about mixed income. You, you have, um, you know, you go from 100% public housing, people who depend on housing, um, um, and, you, and, you, and you replace that, and this is in Holyoke, it's in uh, parts uh, all throughout the country, you replace them with about 20 to 30 percent of people who used to be public housing residents, and then you add some working class, some middle class, and some upper middle class folks. So that is, is embraced by um, um, uh, black politicians, uh, and, and certainly mayors, and that's one indication, I think, of how really racial equality and class equality are, are become separated. The second one, and again also has to do with housing and neighborhoods, has to do with the phenomenon of, of black gentrification. So um, it's not as extensive as white gentrification, I would not argue that. But in certain places like Harlem, uh, the Bronx, uh, Brooklyn, uh, and Bronzeville, which is a historic black uh, neighborhood in Chicago, you've seen a basically a kind of blind eye that, again, the black political class has had towards the displacement of poor black people um, that once used to be um, in inner city neighborhoods and, you know, and as whites and affluent blacks um, take their place, um, there isn't any, there's not much that they uh, do or say against that. So that's just two indicators that today, I, I would argue that you can't connect racial equality with class equality because, you know, or racial progress with class equality because in this case, uh, in both these cases, poor black people um, did not benefit, in fact, were harmed. Um, and so it caused me to sort of say whether or not this present phenomenon of this separation, I think, um, did we see roots of this earlier on um, in, uh, during World War II? And I argue that we, that we did. Um, but I'm arguing more about, or at least interested more about, why is it that there was a kind of uh, blind eye towards class for this, um, in this case, black elites after World War II? Uh, what was their thinking? What was their ideology such that this was not as, as, as prominent? Um, and one of the ways in which I try to get at that question is, first of all, to reject a race relations framework. Um, and it's interesting, many scholars about Du Bois talk about um, Du Bois in these terms. When did he, was he in favor of integration? Uh, when he was, you know, a leader of the Niagara Movement and of NAACP, and when did he step away from integration in the 1930s and started to breast in separatism? Well, for, for many scholars and for many of us, that's the universe of, of black political ideas, black political thought, black political relations. Well, um, I think that's narrow. And in other words, it's, always, it's the argument here that the only thing that should matter to black people politically is how they relate to white people, right? And so this idea that somehow that, oh, I can enter, you know, I can, I, I, I'm pursuing integration, uh, and therefore the idea that, I, you know, that racial progress will come from talented individuals integrating U.S. social institutions, well, that's one way of thinking about it. Uh, and, or I should separate. In other words, we should um, uh, consolidate ourselves, engage in self-help, consolidate our power, and then try to extract concessions, if you will, from the white power elite. Uh, but nonetheless, both of them focus on 
uh, race relations and how we relate to white people. Well, I argue that um, there needs to be a different kind of framework, one that I use in my work,、um, which talks about racial democracy and social democracy. And simply, racial democracy has to do with this idea of achieving racial parity. Um, that that democracy and and progress and equality is measured to the extent that、uh, a black class structure、uh, represents or reproduces a white class structure. So, in other words, if you have 10% wh- rich white people and you know 30% uh, middle class whites and the rest uh, poor uh, whites or m- working class whites, then you should have the same in the black class structure. And that is progress. That is equality. That is parity. That's what racial de- Uh, democracy、um, suggests. Well, I counterpose that with this idea of social democracy, which has had a, you know, a somewhat,、um, I would say,、um, um, interesting history in the United States.、Um, more so, we think about it in terms of Europe, but not quite the same、uh, in the U.S. And that's the idea that actually, that one's racial identity or one's class should not. Um, should not、uh, be the factor by which one gets access to all basic goods. Now, here's a good example of how the two look at housing. In racial democracy, housing—you、um, think about housing—is that that my racial that my racial identity should not stop me from getting、um, any access to housing that I can afford. Uh-huh. And social democracy would say that I shouldn't, my racial identity or my class should not stop me from getting any housing,、uh, regardless of my ability to pay. So that's the difference in terms of what sort of framework. And I would argue that most of, whether it was the NAACP, the、uh, Urban League,、uh, many of those who were forming, um, um, really forming、uh, post-war social movements, were governed by a more racial democratic. Um, idea um, than a social democratic idea, and in, that, in fact, it was、uh, to their advantage to think about、um, to think about、um, uh, racial democracy as the best. And so, I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think that starts to hold、uh, amongst these black elites.、Um, one of the major reasons why I think this happens is that because of the prevalence of racism then and now.、Um, <clears throat> There is a, it's you know, it's not surprising that the achievement of of class mobility、uh, among African Americans was considered to be racially progressive. In other words, if you associate, in particular,、um, you know, our cognitive map of racism in the United States is one that all African Americans are poor or working class, and all whites are affluent. Now, if you place yourself in a neighborhood, for instance, you didn't know. You see nobody. Everyone's inside,、um, you know. And you're walking around. And if someone had to ask you, "Is this a black neighborhood or is this a white neighborhood?" If it's a nice neighborhood, what would you say? It's a white neighborhood. If it looks like a ghetto, what would you say? Lived here, black people, right? So that's the way in which we think about it. You know, despite the the more exposure to upper and middle class blacks, despite having a black president, nonetheless, that cognitive map still associates basically race、uh, with class. So you could understand how middle class blacks thought, you know, if we could just、um, uh, assert our image, if we could just assert. Our、um, our middle class、uh, values, our middle class、um, uh, decorum,、um, we would then displace the association of race with these、uh, stereotypes of laziness, stupidity, promiscuity, and immorality.、Um, so, from their perspective, that their very beings of being black middle class people subverted widely held racist beliefs, and they thought, in a sense, that. Any promotion of class mobility within the black community, within the black middle class, necessarily meant racial progress. So the two p- came together. So you could understand why there was a sort of blind eye to class inequality, because class inequality for them was not inequality. It was just mobility that what undermined racism and, and in fact, projected or promoted、um, a racial、uh, progress. So. This this idea, I think,、um, also meant that the、uh, black middle class needed to engage in certain actions in the black community to make sure that black people 
didn't continue to fulfill these stereotypes. And this is why you get different racial uplift projects. And you have, you know, you have not only the organizations that I talk with, but also the, the black club women who, in, in the late 19th century going up into, you know, this whole idea, which is, a, you know, is still a great idea in today's context, is lifting as I climb, right? So I'm climbing and I'm lifting. But that lifting also means not just helping materially, but also helping tutorially, right? How to talk, how to behave, how to, you know, act. Those kinds of policing of behavior becomes a, a part of that, that sense of duty, you know, a sense of being part of the race um, that uh, folks engaged in. And again, that part of not seeing that sort of inequality or that tension within race, there's in the class, was not possible because you were doing it for the race, you were doing it for racial progress. And so that why, um, that's how it was, uh, it was missed. Um, so one of the things I think uh, is important here is to, um, to think about class behavior on, on the part of the middle class. I, um, it's not um, all middle classes attempt to uh, imbibe or, or, re or repeat or, or reproduce um, the moral morality, moral code of their upper class. And so when black middle class does it and the upper class is, tends to be white, we tend to think that they're simply being assimilationists. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, and they're denying their racial identity. Um, but that's in only purely racialist terms. Uh, class ascension is meant, um, is meant to whitening uh, a essential blackness. But I think there's a more complicated reading of the black middle class behavior, which appreciates their class aspirations on their own terms. To deny privileged blacks their class behavior is to misread the crucial, a crucial component of their sense of themselves and of uh, their politics. Um, and I talk about the relationship between um, racial consciousness and respectability, and upper mobility, how all these things help to, in a sense, um, inform their racial politics, but did so in a way um, that, again, kept their, um, their ideas about class and ideas about class inequality, um, um, you know, kept it hidden from them until, uh, I think, um, a more explicit uh, uh, class politics. Um, so, individual upward mobility is dependent on the achievement orientation fueled by a racial self-confidence. This is a way in which you're thinking about how three of these factors combine to and fuel their, their ideology. And it's facilitated by moral discipline. Racial consciousness convinces elites in a noisy stratum of black strivers that individual and class achievements represented racial progress. Thus the role for politics was to attack institutional racial barriers that prevented potentially um, high-achieving black individuals from becoming upwardly mobile and so blocked the main engine of racial group progress. In addition, this politics also needed a way to ensure that more black individuals were ready to achieve in a competitive, hostile white world. It meant that those blacks who did not exhibit requisite moral discipline and racial consciousness needed to be re-socialized in a reconstituted nuclear family protected by good housing and decent neighborhoods. So as I said, I've been, you know, I wanted to think about this and think about the constitution of, of, of uh, the racial ide ideology of post-war black, um, uh, the black middle class. Uh, and, I, you know, and I think when you do that, you complicate race as the main problem of the 20th century and perhaps the 21st century. In fact, we tend to think or you th of race as connoting racism or racial oppression for good reason. Uh, and we also tend to assume that the fight for racial equality is a proxy for the fight against class inequality, again, for good reason. But in examining post-war black and racial um, ideologies and social movements more closely, we see that it was in the interest of all elites, both black and white, to isolate racial democracy and this idea of racial equality from social democracy and this idea of class equality and to limit the meaning of racial equality to racial parity with whites rather than to accept the idea of a true racial equality that can, not, 
cannot materialize in the United States without class equality. This was a very uh, interesting, three interesting voices here, and uh, I'm sure a lot to digest, but if anybody has a question. I'm very interested in Du Bois's vision and, and activism as a teacher, and as somebody very interested in children, right? The publication of the Brownies book and sort of his vision, I think, of the future. And I really see that informing both the narrative around women, and especially this narrative of the color line and what that means, right? Because, it, and this is also comes out, I think, in his Talented Tenth, right? That's about progeny and narratives around sort of how we imagine progeny. And, and thinking about especially the last two papers and how they, the narrative of the family and the housing, um, really what I see in this discussion throughout is a real focus not just on social movements in terms of certain times but also imagining and I think this is true for Du Bois but it doesn't get spelled out imagining the role of children in the future as kind of a central way of understanding how he pushes for change and helps us to think think about doing so and so I really appreciated your comments going in that direction but I wonder if I could I could beg you to consider this other area. Well, let me answer this just from sort of the perspective of the work that I have done, which has not been so much about children per se, but thank you for the question. It's a great um, thought, Laura. We'll have to talk about it more. Thinking about the potential of framing a research question about how did Du Bois's intellectual understanding of this sort of early articulation of black feminism, right, in this late 19th century moment, and his own sort of political views about black women's rights and black women as leaders change. And what I was especially struck by, right, are some of the early 20th century speeches where he's so very clearly, and I had not thought to articulate it the way you did, but so very clearly focused on respectable reproduction, right? That the young women of Spelman should go forth and marry and bear the children that will be, I imagine, the talented 10th, right? But so, and then, and then that's a very clearly sort of politicized understanding of reproduction and I suppose children. But we'll have to talk about this more because I, I think you're right. I mean, I've always taught the Brownies book in my African American history class, but in a broader scheme of sort of the origins of African American history as a field and not about children. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I have more to add to that. I you know, I. Um, um, what I appreciate from the boys is, uh, and also teaching at a liberal arts college, is um, the importance of that kind of classical education for human development, um, and also for uh, the temper of democracy. Right. So, um, in that regard, but but I also think any if at any time you start to think of the race as a whole, you can fall into um, conventional. Uh, gender relations, um, sexual roles, and any nationalist of any ilk, um, you know, ha, uh, places women in the role of reproduction, and that's, you know, basically it's the man that, that leads, and you're, you know, you're the producer of the nation, you know, you make the warriors and, 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 uh, and, and servants. Um, so, you know, I'm sure there's some ambivalence there um, in terms of some of his thinking quite progressive, um, some of the ways you talked about in terms of gender, but I have to think that also, you know, um, the ideas of race as a whole itself can lead itself to um, perhaps more strict um, possibilities for children depending on their gender. Um, I wanted to ask you a question I've been asking myself, and I wished I've asked in my earlier experience, but I believe there was a role for black women and a power that they had. I know it was present in the Civil Rights Movement because I was there in Mississippi. And I'd like to know whether it was present earlier. But what really existed was the fact that the attitude toward violence 
and the gen gender difference meant that white men were a little more reluctant to hit a black woman than they were to hit a black man. That in every conversation between black men and black and white men, there was violence on the edge of it. But some of the black women could talk back to the white people in a way that the black men couldn't because somehow they weren't threatening in the same way. And I'll, I am quite sure, I wish I'd asked people when I was there, I wish I'd asked powerful women that I knew there whether they saw it in those terms too. I was, there, was no doubt, and there was no doubt if you went on a picket line, for instance, that sometimes the black women would move sort of between <laughs> the, the white men who were mad and the rest of us, some of us white people like me and other black men, who were a little behind because we felt like it was going to decrease the likelihood of violence. It happened sometimes. I was on a picket line where a white man stabbed a black man, uh, so it wasn't very far away. But what it adds up to was that there was a real kind of power that black women had that black men didn't have, and I think the black women knew it. And I suspect that was true even before in earlier era, eras. And I've wondered if you have looked at things in that way. Well, let me not answer the question about the 20th century and think about the 19th century and what that violence looked like for the overwhelming majority of black women in the country. Um, I think there's not sort of questions about being assaulted in that confrontational moment, but being assaulted in a domestic sphere, right, in the context of their labor experience, whether it was as sharecroppers or as maids um, or as nursemaids caring for children, right, that that very real threat of physical violence in the sharecropping context, right, in that sort of disciplinary context, um, I think was always present. And certainly the sexual violence, I mean, and, you know, the thing that now my students are too young, but 10 years ago, my students, I could say, remember Strom Thurmond, right? And the daughter that we learn about, right? I mean, then that, that's a history, that history of sexual violence and sexual exploitation continues well into that, the, the present moment. Um, so, but in terms of thinking about power, I think where, for the women whose writings that I've been researching and certainly am more familiar with in that late 19th century moment, their sense of their own power comes from, one, this idea of respectability, right? That we're gonna put on the clothes and walk the walk and literally talk the talk of well-educated, intellectually empowered, right? And what the historian Darlene Clark Hines so beautifully um, terms as a culture of dissemblance, right? That we will not acknowledge the sexual violence, right? We will not acknowledge in our public presentation of ourselves, of our intellects, of our political agendas, right? We will not acknowledge the ways in which we have historically been sexually exploited, car um, caricatured, and victimized, and will only acknowledge our intellectual and political strength in that sense. Um, and so I think that sense of power is really one that is generated from within, right? And from a real sense of determination. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm fascinated to hear about um, your, your experiences and, and perceptions in the more modern in that more modern moment. You know, in the, in the, in the 19th, I'm thinking about the 19th century and, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass, after he wrestles with Covey and overthrows him, in, in the way he represents the liberating effect of that moment, and he concludes that without power, a man lacks the essential dignity of humanity. And then you contrast the circumstances and the context within which Harriet Jacobs, for example, was struggling, and that kind of a physical confrontation with her master was just simply not a possibility, right? And um, so power would have meant something very, very different from, for her from physical power. So I do think that there are, these, there are differences that go you know, way back in the way power is understood.
because the, the gender, gender dynamics are different um, in the 19th and 18th century within conditions of enslavement, and some of those do get pushed forward into, the, into Jim Crow. Yeah. But one of the, this brief comment, one of the things that, um, you know, when you talk about this interrelationship between race and gender, one of the things that's been a feature of, um, of that interaction is black women are not given the same right. protections, the same assumptions that white women are. So yeah, there probably was some restraint, but what's also what's uh, interesting to me in the ways in which uh, they are not given um, this kind of protection and um, assumption of femininity or preciousness that society, and in fact, violence, they can, I guess, when comparing to white women, mm -hmm. can therefore be more victims of violence. Um, so your comparison was with black men, and I think in that context it makes sense. I can think of other contexts, a more recent one actually, um, where you know they're quite uh, vulnerable um, to um, that violence. Well, of course, just I mean, as the final word, then right, the yeah. the, the most sort of visible case then right is the issue of segregation on the trains, right, in the ladies' car, right, that black women, even if they can afford it even if they looked apart, the can't ride in the ladies' car because that's where white women ride, who mm -hmm. are ladies, mm -hmm. right? And so Ida B. Wells right, is enraged that she's physically ejected. Yeah. Sojourner Truth is physically removed from a streetcar in Washington, D.C. in the 1860s for being bold enough to get on in the front, not the back, right? And the conductor physically takes Truth, and she's injured, right? But is physically removed from the car for aspiring to be a lady. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had a question uh, actually for all the panelists in a way, um, but um, to the last speaker, um, when you um, sort of posed the problem of race and class and you linked it to Du Bois thinking about the talented tenth and also about the color line, um, and I, one could visualize Du Bois kind of stepping into this sort of black tradition of protest and that many of these ideas of uh, racial, rep you know, of racial uplift, moral reform, you know, the representative black man, lead, that you could really trace this right to the origins, you know, you mm -hmm. could, early 19th century, even maybe, you know, 18th century. And, and I wonder whether, you know, you, you did not, in, in, in your talk, you focus more on that problem uh, that sort of di which prevents people perhaps of thinking about social democracy in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and would you see Du Bois is sort of stepping into that? Do you see any evolution in his views? Do you see him as um, going from that talented 10th um, idea to you know, more democratic ways, small d, social democracy maybe even, um, on, on this issue, that he's not, that he's inherited this 19th century discourse of black uplift in a way um, that you can predate to the free black communities, um, and that he takes that somewhere else, and that we can see him building on that. And I think it sort of links to both Nick and Barbara's talk too, because you know, what is Du Bois' contribution to social movement theory, if you will, if radical imagination is what he brings to, the, to those sort of objective factors of make, that make movements possible? And then I'm thinking of Barbara's talk about, you know, why is there no acknowledgement of the work that these black women did at the turn of the century, whether they were club women caught in the discourse of racial uplift, or, um, you know, Du Bois' own problems with Ida B. Wells in the yeah. NACP, in the structure, it's very personal. And, uh, and then his evolution on that issue too, because he talks so eloquently about black women and the plight of black women, right? right? So yeah. I, I just think he is, you know, it's a long-lived intellectual, many different ideas. How would you position him in your various self? Because you, you do, I mean, I can understand the critique, but do we see anything in Du Bois especially towards the end when he is moving more towards the left and when he's thinking in also in more in terms of pan-Africanist global ideas of, of 
of, of liberation. They were not even nationalists, not even confined to nationalist notions. So I, I was just wondering whether, whether you saw that, whether you would you know, take your ideas and, and if Du Bois, in, how would you place him uh, in, your, um, in your sort of scheme? Of, uh, mm -hmm. So I should probably start because uh, most of the comments were directed at my remarks. I mean, first of all, I, um, I was trying to think uh, or talk about those social movements were influenced by Du Bois and certain, so people um, took different ideas from him and they often took, I think, both talent and talent and the idea of, the, of race. Um, <clears throat> so, so that's first. But secondly, I would say that, um, first of all, he her inherited and reproduced and produced and, and also invented some of those ideas, right, about racial re respectability, racial uplift. I mean, he wasn't just some he just, you know, it was mediated through his own uh, context. I guess, um, and this is a question not just about Du Bois, but, you know, um, uh, blacks in the Communist Party, uh, other uh, black radicals, how do they, you know, deal with this, this issue? And it's not something that I've spent a lot of time investigating, but this is, this is sort of my hunch. Um, once... Um, you know, you have, uh, uh, you know, sort of the, the national question and the idea of national minorities. Um, there's a kind of um, pass given for internal class stratification, right? That, that basically, that, and then you also have the popular front and where there was a lot of tolerance for civil rights organizations. And so I think in both of those contexts, I'm not sure that, um, um, class equality, class power, um, class struggle was fully appreciated, fully adopted by Du Bois. Um, I'm not a Du Bois and scholar, so I, you know, but, uh, but at least in my reading, um, I would think that there was certainly, um, and, you know, and, and, and Nick uh, references industrial democracy, which is a form of social democracy. And so, you know, and, you know, let's be frank, um, social democracy was quite more, more tame in the U.S. than it was in Europe, and therefore, perhaps his ideas were closer to what existed. Um, but I would, I would not go as far as to say that he moved so far from his earlier period that he would embrace and wholly, I guess, the idea of class equality. And, and, and <coughs> there's a speech, by the way, that he makes to the Boule, which is a, um, a black elite men's group that really reproduces, and I don't remember exactly with his the 40s or 50s, still this idea that the most talented, the most um, gifted of us should lead the race. And I think that any time you have, whether you're representing women or you're representing black people, Latino, whatever, once you start to think about that as a corporate whole, then you, then you assumed often, not always, but you assume that it's the middle class that's going to lead that group uh, and everyone else supposed, is supposed to follow. So I don't see him stepping away from that enough, I guess, for my taste. Mm -hmm. I would, I, you know, I, I would agree, um, and, um, but I would also suggest that we can actually, of course, liberate ourselves from the personal historical trajectory of Du Bois, you know, that his la last thoughts, in any case, would not necessarily trump his first, you know, that we, we might like what he said later more than we liked what he said earlier, or it could be the reverse, but, but the, the, the individual biography does not predetermine our own assessment. And I think um, that one of the issues that we have to struggle with, the academics anyway, is the degree to which a fundamentally historical approach to these materials um, boxes us in to that kind of evaluation. So, you know, you could get to the absurdity of James Bevel, you know, uh, terrific, you know, civil rights activist, and where does he wind up? Is it a Mooney? I can't remember where he winds up going, you know, and you wouldn't say, well, because he became a Mooney, what happened earlier isn't good, or you wouldn't say, do you know what I'm so that's, I would say we should be a little more free to pick and choose what we find valuable rather than to feel obliged to, you know, have our assessment follow a, any particular historical or 
biographical trajectory. But that's just but the way I look at it. But isn't that yeah. a, an appreciation of historical context? In other words, that we would look at Bevel and what his influences were at that time, what he was responding to, and in that way, I think we there's an embrace of history, right? Oh, and, absolutely. And, and, and not, you're talking about longevity. Or yeah, so, right, I'm not saying let get out of history, so, but don't don't. Uh, you know, don't give in to it entirely, uh -huh. is I guess what uh -huh. I would say. Absolutely, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, I must mention that I have been informed and am under the opinion that uh, Dr. Du Bois rejected that Talenton Tenth idea later on and expressed it because of how the Talenton Tenth turned out. <laughs> the acquisitiveness trumped mm -hmm. that service objective, and uh, he expressed uh, that this was not what he was talking about, this was not the, this was not the way he was directing mm -hmm. it. So, did he I reject, think that's Did he reject the ideas as much as did he reject the unfulfillment of that group's historical mission? As, right? I mean, he was disappointed, yeah. just like E. Franklin Frazier, were both disappointed with the black middle class because they yeah. did not fulfill yes. racial le leadership in the way in which they both thought about it. Yes, yes, yes. My impression is that uh, it was the result in terms of the elevation mm. and service to that end mm. that the, the talented tenth had become very individualistic generally and more so than becoming the servants that he had hoped they would be. Yeah, I don't disagree with that crit critique. I just wonder to what extent that he um, stopped. He, he has no loyalty to the idea of, again, um, because he's disappointed. Just like, I mean, the reason why E. Franklin Frazier writes to Black Bush, why see, he's disgusted by black middle class and not how they, how they had not fulfilled this sense of leading the race into modernity. Um, there are, I think, many of us uh, today who are yearning for the next powerful social movement. Um, what do each of you see as possibly the seeds of what that might be over the next maybe even 10 years? Um, I, I've, mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been grasping onto the idea that it may be something around um, the fight against mass incarceration. And a nexus there with race, class, and gender issues. Um. I think this is the time to bring out the alcohol <laughs> <laughs> on, that, on, that, on that question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the wine or beer, because I, I have an opinion, but. Um, no, go ahead. Start? Go, I'm curious to hear the rest well, of this. I mean, I, <clears throat> it's a, it, a reason I would say that is not to bring out to celebrate, it's to, to drown our troubles. Um, because I don't see um, a lot out there that we can grasp on. And um, my students love the issue of mass incarceration. I mean, I, you know, as a result, um, I'm teaching an urban policy class. I, you know, I, I bring it into my class because that's what, you know, and I have, you know, 16 students they can write about housing, education, or criminal justice. So out of 16, I got 10 writing on criminal justice. Maybe five writing on education, one on housing. Of course, I love housing, and you know, no, nobody <laughs> cares about that. But, it, you know, I, the, I, my issue with that is, um, and I'm, I'm also thinking about with a colleague of mine at Williams College, we're thinking about, because uh, we were just talking about this, creating a course on black radicalism um, and then having our students talk to each other during the semester, you know, is because many of my students who identify as being black radicals, that's the issue they deal with. They listen to, you know, they're following Momia, they're following, they're in many different kinds of organizations. And, you know, if I look back at one of, I think, the failings of black power movement, I think one of the problems was spending so much time trying to get Huey Newton out of jail or spending so much time getting Angela Davis out of jail and not growing leadership or um, developing the you know, sort of kinds of programs that were necessary and that were going to recruit people and to move the f movement forward. So I, 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 as, I, as I think about the fact that I, that I think the drug laws and the mass incarceration are horrible, Yes. I mean, you know, Central Park Five is just, just the latest example. Fruitvale, another example, not so much of mass incarceration, but, you know, the kinds of 
police brutality and the kinds of, uh, of relations that police, and by the way, mostly black working class and poor people have to deal with, that has to, something has to be due with it, but does it, will it lead to a social movement? I have my doubts. Mm-hmm. I have my doubts. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know if you want to, do you want to comment on that answer? What you're, well, this was like the Rorschach test part of the evening. I, I know. Where, we are, are we optimists or pessimists? <laughs> I think I'm a pessimist as well, and perhaps not surprisingly, And again, I mean, we must have self-selecting students, right? Because the majority of students I get are young women who, again, so beautifully and energetically articulate a a view of understanding, again, sort of the intersections between sort of questions about criminal justice and mass incarceration and the figuring of women of color Mm. in that, right? And in terms of both women of color as the targets of police activity and police surveillance, and also, again, of violence in the community, and also the ways in which, without reverting to sort of the model of, you know, that women need to stand behind their men and that, you know, women's real pain comes from the pain experienced by men, but really thinking about the economic and political consequences in women's lives, in their families, when their husbands, fathers, sons, and brothers are killed and incarcerated. And so what I've been tremendously inspired by is what seems to me to be a very new generational shift in thinking about sort of these questions of gender that are not requiring young women of color to silence their own needs vis-a-vis that of men in their community but to really be able to insist again, I mean, sort of like these 19th century women, that you can only understand the community by looking at the relationships among men and women, adults and young people. And so that the problem, you know, the problems can't be disaggregated. Um, And I'm also specifically amazed by the number of young women who are so concerned with issues of sexual justice and reproductive rights. and I, I think in some ways that's coming around again. You know, I feel like eight years ago my students were not so concerned about that. Mm. And suddenly now, they're very aware of it. Sounds like optimism, that's good. <laughs> 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 no, we could use it, that's good, that's good. Yeah. I, think I, I feel optimistic. optimism, we don't have a choice but to be optimistic. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you believe the change is not possible, yeah. What, you, then and that might be a very rational conclusion that's drawn very rigorously from empirical data, but it's not helpful. No. No, I, I, so that's yeah, all yeah, I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. There's a difference between saying if change is possible and whether or not you see evidence of it as uh, coming in the landscape. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And I definitely think it. Yeah, because once you decide it's not, then. They win. I think that uh, the boys was right on target with the ta- with the talented tenth because I can think in my in my lifetime that the organizations that came about in the '60s, um, SNCC, NAACP, well, NAACP came before my lifetime, but the NAACP, SNCC, the Panthers, uh, the Nation of Islam. All these people were very educated people and they were trying to do things to improve, you know, the life, quality of life, the status, what have you, Afro-Americans. You know, these were all educated people, so I think that, you know, Du Bois was right in step with the Tower of the Tenth. It would be foolish to argue that education is not important. It's, you know, also the same thing about uh, leadership is important. I think the thing, though, is that where do you look for that leadership? Um, Who do you listen whose voice is larger than others? to what extent were, I mean, you talk about the Nation of Islam, um, many of those leaders were self-taught, you know, wasn't educated in, informally. Um, you, I, there's evidence that, um, you know, one of the things that there's, you know, class relations are quite in flux in the black community because it's truncated. So there are many people who move into the middle class that were working class, you know, they're previous generation, maybe last year. Um, You know, I think that education, I would separate education, I would separate leadership from necessarily 
class, right? And that then it has to come from a particular class. Um, and, I, and I think that one of the things to think about is, you know, were there organizations, did they build in, internal democratic accountability such that uh, whoever was leader, that the people, you know, not just leadership, because I think too often we focus on that and not on the robustness of the participation of members themselves in a the rank and file, were they uh, influential in the directions that, you know, um, the NAACP was interesting because it was a mass membership organization as opposed to the Urban League. So in there you had more, um, you know, working class participation at different moments. And some could argue that once more working class folks got involved in NAACP after World War II, you began to see more of economic issues coming to bear. But then they, the leadership then also made strategic and I think misguided direction away from that to more legal equality. I mean, misguided, strategic, maybe at the moment they felt that was it and it was going, you know, I'm trying, it was really give people the benefit of the doubt. They thought it would lead to other things. Um, but one thing is clear within our Constitution, within the legal, is that you can correct racial um, uh, inequities legally. You can't correct class inequality legally. There's a real limitation mm -hmm. on what you can talk about in terms of class, That's in terms of you t if you use a legal and a constitutional framework. So, you know, so they made some choices, and, and, you know, and, and there was progress to be made, no question about it. Um, but I think there were some self-limitations in that as well that could have gone in, um, in other directions that um, didn't. And also, unfortunately, perhaps left certain... Um, um, roots um, are uh, sort of a path dependency on um, organizations that are, are today that don't follow, you know, that continue this kind of, I think, racial democratic um, um, of, uh, direction. So thank you very much, everybody. We could not answer all the questions because we are running out of time. And it was very interesting conversation, very interesting questions. I thank you very much for this last event of the boys in our time. It's been a wonderful uh, fall. Thank you very much for the three of you. Bye-bye.